I've been looking forward to getting to these passages of Scripture because it's been a long, difficult journey. In some ways, the, uh, what's happening in the book of Revelation mirrors much of what's going on uh, in our nation today. Uh, for us, not on the same scale, not in any way, shape, or form, but nevertheless, uh, a lot of what is happening, the darkness, the sense of not being able to come out on the other side of something, just when you think it's over, it all starts back up again. All those things have been kind of uh, echoing for us. And uh, I think I have a better uh, appreciation of the book of Revelation than I've ever had before. And it's a book that I've uh, taught and studied and read many, many times. But it certainly has uh, more meaning as we go through things that are similar. And so we've come now to the uh, 16th sermon in this series. Uh, we've titled that The Epistle of Jesus, and this one is The Kingdom Comes. Uh, so I just want to give you a real quick overview of what's going to happen in this chapter, because it, it's a chapter of great contrast, of highs and lows. Um, one of the greatest things that's ever going to happen in all of history takes place, and by far the worst thing that will ever take place in history also takes place in this same chapter. So there are these uh, great events, these five great events that take place in the book of Revelation chapter 20. First, a great thing, Satan is taken and he's bound for a thousand years. Uh, the millennium starts. And so that is as high as it's ever going to get for human history uh, for that event to take place. No Satan and the Lord rules and reigns on the earth for a thousand years. Secondly, the righteous, or the rest of the righteous dead, the Old Testament saints, are resurrected and they join Christ, and together they reign with the New Testament saints during the millennium. Then after the millennium, believe it or not, Satan is released. He deceives the nations that are on the earth at that time, in particular two nations called Gog and Magog, and there is one last great battle that takes place at the end of that thousand-year uh, time span, at the end of the millennium. Uh, again, why that happens there, we'll talk a little bit about. But it is interesting that after it seems what, what could get better, Satan is let go. And then finally, the unrighteous, the unsaved dead that are in hell are raised and brought before the great white throne judgment. And there, from once they are judged, they are cast in the lake of fire for eternity. So we go from that great high of the millennium. The only thing that's going to be greater and uh, more exciting is heaven itself. And then we're going to go to this terrible low at the great white throne judgment. So let's start in Revelation chapter 20 and go down to verse 1. And let's look at the Savior rules. 20th chapter, first three verses. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. So this time period, again, is called the millennium. It's a familiar term for us. Uh, we've heard it if we've been in church any length of time at all. The thousand-year reign of kingdom of Christ is called the millennium. The word millennium is a Latin word composed from two words. It's a compound word, mille, which means a thousand, and annum, which means year. So we have a thousand year. And so that term millennium is not found in the Bible, only that uh, phrase, thousand years. And we have come to, I like the word missionary is not found. And uh, the other words like that aren't there, but we've come to know them as biblical words and as words that we're familiar with. So a thousand year reign of Christ. Now, you'd think, who, who wouldn't like to have the millennium? Who would want to say this isn't going to take place? But believe it or not, there are people called... Uh, all millennialists who deny that the millennium is going to take place, all meaning none, and they believe that, uh, this is really hard for me, that the millennium is not any length of time, and it doesn't take place at any particular time. In fact, we could be living the millennium. Well, I don't know what millennium they're living in, but for me, Satan is still alive and well. Uh, there's still all the things that Satan does um, to me personally and to this world at large, and I cannot believe anyone would think that Satan has been bound. Uh, the post-millennialists also have some beliefs about this. Uh, they believe, uh, again, that uh, Satan has been bound during this time period of uh, the church age. And that's why the church is very powerful. Now, maybe in the late 1800s, early 1900s, when missionaries were being sent around the world before the Great World Wars, 
you might could make that argument, but I don't think hardly anybody makes that argument anymore. We understand that what we're looking at is a premillennial, which means that the Lord's coming precedes the millennial kingdom. Now, for those who would deny this, you have to deny that the phrase 1,000 years is used in this passage six times in six verses. This means that six times you must deny the scripture if you refuse to believe in a literal thousand year reign of Christ, which begins after his return and before eternity starts. And then again, why would you want to deny something as wonderful as a millennium? It'll be the greatest period of history on earth since the Garden of Eden. In many ways, it is the restoration of the Garden of Eden, as earth would have been had Satan not deceived Adam and Eve. It'll be the greatest period on earth uh, since that time. The Old Testament is filled with promises of God to his people Israel uh, that there will be a time of heaven on earth. Their king, their God, will once again walk with them as God walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the evening. So this time is revealed to us in the book of Revelation as lasting a thousand years. Just because it's not mentioned as being a thousand years in other places doesn't mean anything. This is progressive revelation. We've talked about this. So here at this point, we now find out. The Lord tells us it's going to be for a thousand years. That kingdom he's talked about in the Old Testament is this long. And that's simply progressive revelation. And so it takes place after the Messiah, the hero that defeated the beast and the dragon, saves Jerusalem. So on that great military victory, the millennium starts, as you would think would be appropriate. And there's many places in the Old Testament that describe the millennium. Uh, we could look at passages from throughout the Old Testament. In fact, if we did nothing more than just read the passages from the Old Testament about the millennium, uh, we would easily go past my time uh, in the pulpit this morning. Easily we could fill up a half hour to 40 minutes just of reading about what it says in the Old Testament. Now, at this point, some of you are thinking, are you sure that's not going to happen anyway? <laughs> well, I don't think it is. I was very careful about trying to pull out just particular highlights. So let me share some, just some highlights with you because it really is, if all we had was a book of Revelation, we'd know it's a thousand years. We know that Satan would be there. And we could use a little bit of imagination to think how wonderful that would be. But thank the Lord for prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel who filled in the details. And there's such wonderful things that they tell us about this time of rain. So Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 2. In the midst of the Lord reprimanding his people, telling them they're going to be taken away into captivity, he also says, but I'm going to bring you back. And it says in chapter 2, verse 2, And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, and he shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow into it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he shall judge among the nations, and he shall rebuke many people. And then this passage you're familiar with, And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up nation against sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. That is engraved at the United Nations, but they left out God. <laughs> and so don't expect it to happen until they bring God back in, until God brings it in himself. Isaiah chapter 35, the entire chapter deals with this. So I just want to look at uh, verses uh, 10, uh, 5 through 10. I think that's what I've got. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, Isaiah 35, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For the wilderness shall waters break forth. In the wilderness waters shall break forth, and streams in the desert. And the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. In the habitations of dragons, where each lay shall be grass with reeds and rushes. And a highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those the wayfaring men, though fools, shall not err therein. And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Isaiah 65 perhaps has some of the best descriptions. It's the one I think you'll think of most readily. And some people read these and think this is heaven. But this isn't heaven. This is the millennium. Heaven's actually going to be better than this, if you can imagine it. Verse 17 of Isaiah chapter 65 says, For behold... I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. But be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, 
I create Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. And the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the child should die a hundred years old, but the sinner being a hundred years old shall be accursed. And they shall build houses and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit thereof. They shall not build in another inhabit, they shall not plant in another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth for trouble. For they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock, and dust shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, saith the Lord. Again, there are so many other scriptures that I read through and, and chose these. And all of them describe this wonderful time in which Messiah is going to be on the earth. And there's just no death except perhaps accidental death. I don't even know. I get, that's probably possible. If somebody walked off a cliff, I guess they could die during the millennium. But the Bible says you won't, you'll still be considered an infant when you're 100 years old. You'll still be a young person until you're 100 years old because you can live that entire millennium, a thousand years. A person born during this time can live the entire time and not die. It'll be like it was uh, in the Garden of Eden. It'll be like it was when Methuselah reached that 969-year mark. So we are to be, and the saints of God, are to be ruling and reigning with Jesus. Now, the millennium is mostly about Israel. It was their promise back in the Old Testament. And it's been promised them since the exile to Babylon and even hinted at before that uh, by David. Uh, his last psalm recorded in the book of Psalms uh, talks about the millennial kingdom. And though it is mostly their kingdom on earth, isn't it amazing that we will be there ruling and reigning with the Savior? I don't know all of what that entails. We're not given those kind of details in the New Testament. But I knew what I know that only heaven will be more wonderful than Christ on earth, sitting on the throne of David, and all the people of the earth coming to hear him. Won't it be unbelievable during the millennium that instead of trying to get people to come to church, instead of standing out in the, in the Athens marketplace or some street corner trying to get people to just take a track, won't it be amazing? <laughs> They're just going to come flooding into Jerusalem. They're going to hear about Jesus, and they're just going to come running. You know what our job may just be? We'll just be ushers. <laughs> we'll just stand there and say, right this way to Jesus. Come on, keep it moving. Right this way, come on. And it'll be so different. It wouldn't it be great. Can you imagine how many people are going to be saved during the millennium? First, there's going to be a population explosion. There's no sickness. There's no death. Uh, there's no hunger. There's no shortage of water. The earth will flourish as it did in the Garden of Eden. But there won't be a serpent. And there won't be sin in that sense. And there won't be death in that sense. So there will be billions upon billions of people born during this time. They will replenish the earth after the terrible time of the tribulation. And all those people will want to come and hear Jesus. And they will hear Jesus himself. Not some poor old preacher trying to do his best to tell them about Jesus. But they will see and they will hear him. They will see and hear the one who spoke as none other before ever spoke. They will hear him as Galilee, Nazareth, Sychar, Jerusalem, and Jerusalem, and Jerusalem, Jer Jericho and Jerusalem did when he first came. Back then, in just about two years, he had thousands of followers. Thousands of people were trying to follow him after he fed them on that uh, miracle of the loaves and the fishes. Just imagine how many people believe over a thousand year time period while Jesus teaches and preaches. We can't. I don't think you could number them. I don't think our minds can conceive of that because we're so used to fighting all the things we have to fight in this world. And after all these hundreds of years of reading the Sermon on the Mount, the Olivet Discourse, the teaching in the upper room, all those years listening secondhand as the disciples asked Jesus, teach us to pray. But then we will be able to hear him ourselves. The whole world will be able to hear his voice. He will speak and they will hear. People of that generation will look at us as we're ushering people into the Lord's presence, I guess. And they'll say, they'll look at us and they'll say, see that guy right there? See that lady right there? They believed before Jesus came back. What faith they must have had. That's us. 
That's uh, this age we now live in, a time of walking by faith and not by sight. And great is the reward for those who keep that walk and hold to that faith. That's our calling. That's our time. This is our commission to walk by faith and continue to do the job to bring as many as we can to Jesus Christ. Remember the story of Thomas and, and uh, Jesus? After Thomas said, I won't believe unless I see the scars. And Jesus appeared before them and he said, here's my hands. Uh, reach there and touch them and, and give me your hand and thrust it into my side. Thomas didn't need to do that. He knew exactly who it was. And in John chapter 20, verse 26, Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Paul made this statement in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 6. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. This is our task. This is our calling. This is our challenge until Jesus comes back. Walk in faith. And one day, one glorious, wondrous, fantastic day, we will see him face to face and hear those wonderful words of life directly from his own lips. So, you want to do something you haven't done before, at least not in a sermon I preached? <laughs> I like this. It probably makes all of you nervous. So we're going to sing, Won't It Be Wonderful There? Because that's what this is describing. And I'm going to ask you to join me on the chorus of this song and just sing along with me. I think most of us know it. I had to get the tune in mind. <laughs> this is why I don't do this very often. When with the Savior we enter the glory land, won't it be wonderful there? Ended the troubles and cares of the story land, won't it be wonderful there? Join me on the chorus. Won't it be wonderful there, having no burdens to bear, joyously singing with heart bells all ringing, oh, won't it be wonderful there? Walking and talking with Christ the supernal one, won't it be wonderful there? Praising, adoring the matchless eternal one, won't it be wonderful there? On the chorus, won't it be wonderful there? Having no burdens to bear, joyously singing with heart bells all ringing, oh, won't it be wonderful there? there. Hey Amen. Even at my age, another first. That's, that's something I count on. So let's go to the second part. Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. After the Savior rules, the saints reign. I want to spend a little more time there. Verse 4 of Revelation chapter 20. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, and neither had received his mark upon their foreheads, or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. For the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So this is the resurrection of the righteous. All of the righteous, all of the saved, of all ages and times, will be resurrected during the first resurrection. But we need to understand that first here as it's used is in regard to the second resurrection that's mentioned and also in this passage. It's not first as the very first resurrection, resurrection that ever took place. Uh, the first resurrection uh, that we have in the Bible was by, done by the power of God in the Old Testament under Elijah and Elisha. Uh, you remember the story of Elisha. They just laid a, bunch, a dead man in his grave. He touched the bones and he came alive. And so, and Elijah uh, raised the, the a widow's son. So, this is not the first resurrection. It's not the first time that people have been raised from the dead. Jesus stopped a funeral procession and raised a son to his mother and brought back to life a precious daughter to her parents. Lazarus was raised four days after he was dead. And all of Jerusalem heard of that miracle. It was, it was a, a, the pivot point for the last week of Jesus' life. Jesus was the first fruit of all the resurrected, and even when Jesus was crucified, some graves were opened when Jesus was crucified, and they said that the saints were seen and gave testimony. 
Paul and Peter both were able to bring back to life disciples of Jesus during the early days of the church. So this is not the very first resurrection. It is the first in reference to the second. So uh, it's not the sense of the chronology. It is at first as regards the book of Revelation as contrasted with the second revelation or resurrection. The first resurrection begins at the rapture of the saved during the church age. It continued with the resurrection of the two witnesses that took place as the whole world looked on in Revelation 11. Next, here we have the resurrection of the faithful heroes of the tribulation, martyred by the beast and his followers. This will occur soon after Christ returns to earth, Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. The last resurrection will be that of the Old Testament saints also at this time, though not specifically spelled out here, but we read of it in places like Ezekiel, Daniel, and uh, Isaiah. So let me show you Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since. There was a nation even to that same time, and at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever." In Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 11, Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried, our hope is lost, we are cut off from our parts. Therefore prophesy, prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people. And brought you out, up out of your graves, and shall put my spirit in you, and ye shall live, and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall you know that the Lord has spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. So that resurrection was promised. The people uh, in the Old Testament believed it. They looked forward to it. They didn't have all the details. They didn't know that there was going to be a resurrection of the New Testament saints that actually would precede theirs. But it's all considered part of that first resurrection, starting with the rapture and the graves opening all the way until this resurrection in Revelation chapter 20. And you must also understand this. When the Bible's talking about resurrection here, it's a bodily resurrection. John has already seen the saints, Old Testament and New Testament, in heaven with the Lord as souls, as spirits. But we are created as a body and a soul. And Jesus in his resurrection was not just a spirit. He actually ate some food, some honeycomb and some fish to prove to his disciples he wasn't just a spirit. And so when he was resurrected as a body and soul, we should understand that as Jesus is resurrected, we will also be resurrected. We will have a body and soul. So when it talks about the resurrection, it's talking about that body coming back, renewed, remade, perfect without sin, and our souls being joined to it again so that for all eternity, we are as God created us, body and soul. Our souls, which have been absent from the body but present with the Lord, will now be reunited with a perfect, sinless, ageless body. And yes, I will have hair. Some of you won't recognize me. I may not recognize some of you, but that body is not going to be this body. And after the last of the first resurrections, the saints shall reign with their king. This will include the Old Testament saints of Israel, but it will also include us, the church, the bride of Christ, in some way. We don't have as much detail, but we do have what Jesus told the disciples in Luke chapter 22 and verse 29. And I appoint unto you a kingdom... As my Father hath appointed unto me, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And so whatever the role is, we will be there ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ. I'm not sure how this is going to be done and it really doesn't matter. The details, if they were needed, would be given to us. Personally, I'm hoping the Lord gives me a little mountaintop somewhere like Joshua gave Caleb. An island would be just as nice. I'm not trying to be picky. But I do know somehow, somewhere, the Lord's going to give us the ability to rule and reign. So the next event in Revelation chapter 20 is a hard one for us to understand. It has parallels with the Garden of Eden. In fact, if you're going to try and understand the book of, uh, of the idea of the millennium, your best place is to look at the Garden of Eden because it is a restoration. The parallels it has with the Garden of Eden, just as it does with the millennials, wonder and beauty, and they're comparable. This next event gives us some insight into that. So Satan is released, Revelation chapter 20 and verse 7. And when the thousand years are expired, 
Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is the sand of the sea. And they went up the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So this is the rebellion of the nations. After a thousand years, Christ on earth, no sin, well, not sin in the sense of Satan causing it, but no death, no sickness, no famine. Uh, there's, there's no reason a person born at the beginning of the millennium can't live all the way to the end of the millennium. And here at the end, Satan is released. Satan, who has been taken and bound with a chain by a single angel, when the Lord takes away Satan's power, it's just gone. He's nothing. And the Lord sends one angel. He takes him, wraps him up with a chain, and throws him into this stinking foul pit. The Bible says after this, when he's released, he goes forth to the four corners of the world, to Gog and Magog. The Bible says there is numerous of the sand of the sea. And once again, they march on and surround Jerusalem. Can you believe it? It makes no sense. Why would they do such a thing? It's a very short battle. God sends fire from heaven. Their destruction is so complete that it is as though they were devoured with the flame. So we can't help but ask ourselves, why set Satan free? Why would you do this? It's, it's, why wouldn't we just go straight into heaven? Why wouldn't it just all end right there? Time would stop and eternity begin. But Satan is set free. And why he is loose for a short season here at the end of the millennium, in this most peaceful time in all of Earth's history, another war comes, one of the biggest wars. I certainly don't have the mind of God on this, but I think it's the same answers you'd be given or you would give to someone asking why Satan was allowed to live after he rebelled and fell from heaven, or why he was allowed into the Garden of Eden to tempt even Adam. It's the same answer given when someone asks why is there sorrow and pain and sickness in God's creation. It's the same answer you have to give when somebody asks, why is there a heaven and a hell? After a thousand years of no Satan, God releases him one last time. This gives all those who are born, in the millennium, born during the millennium, and there will be billions upon billions, a greater population the world has ever been able to sustain. It gives those people a choice. It is the final proof that man is not a fatalistic puppet jerking on the strings that God pulls but that God desires and will have only those who truly choose him as their God. Even after all of this, all of God's goodness, all of God's blessings, everything that you could imagine the Garden of Eden would have been, will happen during the millennium, or very close to it. And at, just as it was in the Garden of Eden, people ask, well, why was Satan there? Because man had to have a choice. Otherwise, man's only a puppet. Man's no better than an animal. But man was made in the image of God, therefore he has that choice, and therefore there must be two choices. There must be. And so even at the end of the millennium, Satan is released to give one final choice for all the world, for those who have just been mouthing uh, their allegiance to Jesus Christ, mouthing their faith. They have a choice, and millions, perhaps billions of them, choose one more time to rebel. Could there be any greater proof of God giving mankind this choice, even if that choice is eternally and desperately wrong? So after this last war, Satan is once again taken and is now cast in the lake of fire. There he joins the beast and the false prophet who have been there for a thousand years. They've had the lake of fire to themselves for a thousand years. I don't think they can talk to each other, but they've been the only inhabitants of the lake of fire. And then... Uh, but they are not the last ones because in verses 11 through 15 of Revelation, we're going to see the sinners judged. This will bring us to an end of the book. So we've gone from the heights of the millennium, this most wonderful, beautiful time in all of Earth's history. And now we're going to go to the worst time for all of mankind who passed through that history and all of, all of history. Verse 11, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This 
is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So this is the great white throne judgment. Christians don't stand here. Only the lost stand at the great white throne judgment. This is the second resurrection. And anyone who comes from the second resurrection has no hope. There's no opportunity that when the books are open, something is going to get them out of the eternal punishment that they've already been in, waiting temporarily in hell. This is not the resurrection to eternal life, but the resurrection to an eternal death. All the dead who are not in that first resurrection will stand before God who is seated upon the great white throne, which symbolizes utter, pure holiness and justice. That is why it's so well etched into our minds as the great white throne. The unrighteous dead are now judged by two books, and maybe more than just two books. The first is the book of life, the book of their uh, deeds and actions, these two books. They are judged according to their works, this says, and their place in the lake of fire, their degree of punishment is according to their works. The lake of fire is just as the title declares it to be, an, even last, an everlasting fire in which there is absolute justice. But understand that when the books are opened, no one in this resurrection is going to be found in the Lamb's book of life, but that is the final declaration that will be shown to them, you are not here because you did not put your faith in Jesus Christ. But there will be a judgment according to what they did in life. God is infinitely just. And it's not one punishment fits all, and even in hell. A Hitler, a Stalin, a Mao will not be judged in the same way that a person who did not commit the same horrific sins and atrocities that they did. So how do you know that? How do you know there's actually going to be degrees of punishment in hell? Well, Jesus told us that. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 20, Then began he to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. He says, Woe to thee, Chorazin! Woe unto thee, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted into heaven, because Jesus was there in Capernaum. And thou, Capernaum, which have been, uh, for it, the mighty works which had been done in thee had been done in Sodom. It would have remained unto this day, but I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. So Jesus is actually telling them, <laughs> you folks are going to be punished worse than Sodom, worse than Tyre and Sidon, the seat of all the worst kind of paganism in that ancient world. He says it's going to be worse for you because Jesus was there among you, and you could hear him and see him and, and know the works that he did, and you still rejected him. Therefore, it will be worse in hell for them. Mark chapter 6, verse 11 says, And whosoever shall not receive you nor hear you, <clears throat> when ye depart thence, shake off the dust under your feet <clears throat> for testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. There are degrees of punishment according to how you've lived, according to the chances you had to hear the gospel, and according to what you've done. And so punishment in hell will be terrible. I have no idea how the God will make even an eternal lake of fire just, but he will. And they are judged according to their works. And if anyone is counting on the lake of fire being tolerable, if you think that you can be lost and a really good guy, and it's just going to be a little warm when you get to the lake of fire, you need to understand what Jesus said about eternal punishment. And he said more than anybody else because he knew more than anybody else. The lake of fire will be a place of suffering. Mark chapter 9, verse 43, Jesus said, giving that example of how impossible it is to save yourself, he said, if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell. Notice how he describes it, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. If thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life. The halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. If thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. Better for thee to enter the kingdom of God one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. We've been talking about this on Wednesday night. He's not telling them you can get to heaven by cutting yourself up. He's telling them it makes as much sense for you to cut off body parts to think you can earn salvation. What I want you to see here is that he's telling them hell is not going to be anything but a terrible torment. 
There, there may be degrees, and I don't know how God's going to work that out, but it is still a terrible torment. Revelation 14, verse 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest nor night who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark in his name. Now, those will probably be the worst ones. The worst punishment is reserved for those at that point. So let me bring this to a conclusion. Revelation chapter 20 is a book that's filled with contrast. We go from the heights of God's grace and love to the depths of His justice and judgment in this chapter. We see the world it was meant to be when Adam and Eve were placed in the garden, but we also see the final results of man's sin. That same sin that spoiled the Garden of Eden will also be the same sin that spoils the end of the millennium. I want to live on the heights, not in the depths. I want to live on the heights of my life now, and I sure want to be on those heights, reigning with my, G my King Jesus during the millennium. And just like those who face a choice at the end of those thousand years, it is my choice right now. I can choose where I want to spend the rest of my, the millennium and where I will spend eternity. This is the awesomeness of being created in the image of God. The gift of God's image to us is also the gift of free will. And the consequence of such a great gift is literally the price of eternity. I'm glad we haven't been created as puppets, as some kind of fatalistic uh, things that God just, just moves us at will. I'm glad that we have that choice, but understand the consequence that comes with that choice is that we make the choice for eternity. And if anyone tells you that God picks and chooses from eternity who will go where, they simply don't understand the image of God. They simply don't understand what the whole Bible tells us. You make this choice. Otherwise, God is not worshipped and God is not honored by the choice that anyone makes. So where do you intend to be when eternity begins? You must make sure that the right choice is made now and to be a part of the resurrection of the righteous and not a part of the resurrection of the damned. Two resurrections. Your choice determines which one you're going to be a part of. Let's all stand. We're going to close with a, 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 